and Jill went up the hill. Went up the hill. Who put her in? The movie is about how a speech expert helps the King of England overcome his stutter so he can speak to a nation at war. Well, behind this story is another great story of a seriously late bloomer. At the age of 73, screenwriter David Seidler has earned his first Oscar nomination for crafting the King's speech. And CNN's Alan Duke had the opportunity to sit down with him. Alan, thanks for joining us. A very interesting story. So, uh, listen, uh, David's idea for a script for more than, he had this idea for more than 20 years. What took him so long to write it? Well, well, really, he came up with the idea in college more than 50 years ago because he was a stutterer as a teenager. And King George VI was uh, a model for him of how to overcome it. If you've seen the movie or haven't seen the movie, it's a dramatic story of how the king did that with a speech therapist. And, of course, it was very instrumental in helping Britain in World War II. Very important part of our history, and he wanted to write about it. Well, the story's been told about how he delayed writing it because the queen mother asked him, please don't write it until after my death. She lived to be 101 years old, so he did have to wait more than two decades to write it. But what we don't know, or you might not have heard, is something he told me at lunch the other day. Uh, he said that if he had written it when he started out to write it really seriously in his 40s, he very possibly would never have written a script good enough to be nominated for an Oscar. I don't think it would have been the same. Uh, this required going back into the pain and the loneliness and the isolation and frustration of being a stutterer. And being a stutterer is rather like having a very bad toothache. When you've got the toothache, all you're thinking about is, wow, my tooth really hurts. All I can think about is that pain. As soon as you get to the dentist, and the dentist fixes it, the last thing you want to remember is how that tooth aches. You just blank it out. The mind forgets it. And the same thing with uh, stuttering. Once you get control over it, it's such an awful experience to be a stutterer that once you've got a handle on it, the last thing you want to do is remember what it was like. But as a, um, a more mature writer, let me put it that way, when you start looking back on your life, it is easier, I think, to uh, go back into the past. And therefore, I was able to really put my head back into being a stutterer. Uh, which I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. By the way, I might mention that I shot that with my flip cam in the polo lounge in Beverly Hills. You know that room, Don Lemon, always all kinds of celebrities there. Uh, and I didn't plan to even do an interview with him. We were just having lunch, and he started talking in a, an amazing way, and I asked permission, and he allowed me to record it. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm not sure if you got a chance to talk to him about there's this, you know, this a bit of an uproar because people are saying, hey, this is the favorite. And really, while it's a good movie, you know, the social network has more of an impact on the world and it should be the favorite movie. I don't know if you guys got to talk about that, but I'm sure you've heard people say that. Yes, I have. And of course, with what's been going on in the Middle East, in Egypt, with Facebook and everything being an influence there, that may have an impact on that. But what we also know is that the, the, the King's Speech story had an impact on the world during World War II. And if, if the king had not been able to rise to the challenge of that king's speech uh, in September 1939, would he have inspired the world, actually inspired America to, in, to join the effort later? And so it was very important that he overcome the stuttering. That's a very good point. Things may have been much different. So, Alan, we're not finished yet. Stick around right after the break. We want uh, the lowdown on all the high-end freebies that celebs get as they... Uh, you know, take part in the Academy Awards and they walk down the red carpet. All those freebies. Alan Duke will update us. Back now with Alan Duke live in La La Land, Los Angeles. So forget about the gowns and the glamour. So Alan, tell me about the Oscar goodies, all these goodie bags, the swag surrounding tomorrow night um, is very glamorous as well. But some would-be celebs have to be very persuasive to get it. If you're if you're on the A list, then you automatically get it. But if you're maybe on the B, C, or D list, you have some persuade, persuading to do. Yeah, there are a lot of these what we call the swag suites, the swag events. And everybody from A to Z, all the lists, try to get into them. Some of them are must-haves and some of them, well, 
you'll see are not necessarily the iPods or the iPads that a lot of people like to get. I went to one yesterday uh, in Beverly Hills at a hotel there and you see the fair. Uh, uh, you have chocolates, you have makeup, you have some jewelry there, but uh, not even any recognizable celebrities really uh, hardly uh, there. Yes, even dental floss uh, was given away. So uh, truly swag, even flip flops. But there are things of, of, of a lot of, uh, I mean, really iPads given away and, and some expensive jewelry given away to some of the A-listers, but not everybody gets them. And so I talked with Tracy Pendleton and Carrie Feinstein, who operate this one, about how you qualify for the good stuff at a swag event. Does everybody get everything? I mean, everybody's not equal in this, are they? No, I mean, there's always um, sponsors that are gifting different products to different people. It sort of just depends on how valuable each person is to their specific brand. What, what do they do? Do they go and uh, uh, search the IMDB to see what their ranking <laughs> is? How, how do you figure this out? Well, I think they see someone, you know, like a Jennifer Love Hewitt's going to come through and... Of course, the jewelry girls are going to want to give her, you know, great pieces like Sulpata and Chicory. They'll give her, you know, some of their better pieces because Jennifer is always out on the carpet. She's always going to events. They know she'll wear it and their jewelry will get great exposure versus maybe someone who's not out doing quite as much as, as Jennifer. And they end up with a bottle of water and the flip-flops. <laughs> They'll get a little more than that. Uh, well, but... dental floss. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of thing would an A-lister take home from this, uh, this event? from you. Let's see, our sterling silver and pearl necklace has been a huge hit because it's an update on pearls and girls love pearls. If, if Lindsay Lohan came down here, would you give her a necklace? It depends on if she loved it. Loved it enough, yes. And she didn't walk away with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. Oh, and I can tell you, Lindsay, Lo Lindsay's been to a lot Lindsay of those. Lohan that you asked. Yeah, uh, and, and there are just down the street from there, over at the Four Seasons Hotel, there was a much more exclusive one where pretty much only A-listers were showing up, and they were in private dressing rooms, and you really don't see pictures of that. But you see the, the reality stars and others at these things, and it's, it's really a grab bag for them, and they love getting it, a few hundred dollars worth of stuff, and take it home, and they feel like celebrities. All right, pick one up for me, will you? Thank you, Alan. Duke. Oh, sure. All right, appreciate it. Enjoy tomorrow night.